If you've been following this channel recently, in amongst all the new camera releases, you'll know that we did a couple of days of side-by-side -side tests with a whole bunch of cameras. Now, these tests aren't comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination, so we can't use them to do a big comparison between the cameras or anything like that. But what we can do, though, is use them to compare the specific areas that we tested and compare different cameras directly in those specific areas. And first on the list are the two cameras that started these tests in the first place, the A7S Mark III and the Canon R5. The internet has been full of discussion between these two cameras for the last month or so, but we really wanted with this video to just focus down on those specific areas of their image quality and see how they stack up against each other, forgetting about all the rest of the cameras. We did an over and under exposure test, a sharpness test, and some high ISO tests, so let's dive straight in. First up, let's just look at this image normally exposed from each camera. So this is the scene we lit from these over and under tests. We exposed for the charts here, putting the white chip at the right place for each log format as needed. We also tried to favor the ISO that works best for each camera. So here, the Canon is at ISO 400 and the Sony is at 640. First up is the best quality that each camera can do internally. On the R5, that's 8K RAW on the top, and for the A7S Mark III, it's the normal 4K all I mode. Now, the A7S Mark III is able to do raw out to the Ninja 5, but both of these cameras were pre-production models, and when we filmed this, we didn't have the right beta firmware on the Atomos Ninja 5 to record that raw. So for these tests, XAVCSI was the best we could get out of the camera. But once the camera actually ships, people with the Ninja 5 will be able to get a higher quality recording option. But here, as you would expect, the Canon's the clear winner. The 8K RAW looks incredible on the R5. I've seen very expensive cinema cameras that don't look as good as this. I mean, it's very detailed indeed, and the colors look great. Not that the Sony looks bad at all, it looks great. It's just not as good as that 8K RAW, which is hardly unsurprising, really. In fact, when we swapped the Canon over to the more practical 4K all eye recording format to match the Sony, they now look much closer. I think now the A7S actually has the edge. Colors look great on both of them, and the Sony is that little bit more detailed. So let's now start to overexpose. So this is now two stops brighter on both cameras, with the exposure graded back to be as close as possible to the normal exposure. This gives us an idea of how well the cameras can cope with being accidentally overexposed and how much information they maintain in their highlights. And both cameras look great. I can hardly see a difference on either of them from the normal exposure. At three stops over, we've started to lose detail on the bright part of the wall behind Jonna, a bit more so on the Canon than on the Sony. And on both cameras, his skin is just starting to feel a little plasticky. Again, slightly more so on the Canon than on the Sony. At plus four, the wall has definitely clipped on both cameras, and we're starting to get some clipping on Jonna's forehead. But both cameras have done pretty well here. I mean, four stops over was as high as I went here, and it's pretty overexposed. Here's the same shots with a normal lookup table on them, and here's the ungraded log files. As you can see, this is pretty substantially overexposed footage from both cameras, and they both handle it well. I think the A7S III does have the edge here though, most likely because it uses a flatter log format, which holds more dynamic range. All of this has been with the normal all eye mode on the Canon, but if we jump over to the 8K RAW instead, four stops now look significantly better. In fact, it's impressively good. Just for fun, here's plus four stops on the 8K RAW on the R5 and normal exposure on the A7S Mark III below. And I think the overexposed 8K RAW actually looks better. I mean, the 8K RAW on this camera is just so impressive. It's like looking at footage from a whole different, much more expensive camera. In underexposure, though, things get quite interesting. This is back in the normal 4K all eye mode on the R5, and at minus one, both cameras are doing okay. But at minus two, you can really see a difference. The R5 gets far noisier, and it has horrid green chroma noise as well. The A7S Mark III is also noisy, but it's kept its color, so it looks much better, I think, here than the R5. 
There is clearly noise reduction going on in the shadows though, as the noise is very soft and almost smeary. At minus three, the difference is just day and night. The R5 is completely unusable, this underexposed. Again, the better log formats on the A7S Mark III are really giving it the edge here. C-Log1 just can't cope with this extreme and underexposure. And this is extremely underexposed. For perspective, let's replace the corrected grade here with just a normal lookup table again, just so that you can see and get a gauge for how underexposed both of these shots really are. In 8K RAW, the R5 does perform a little bit better. The noise is fine, and it would probably clean up with some noise reduction in post, even at minus three stops. Here you can see just how much noise reduction the A7S is doing in camera as well. The noise is much softer, which, although it looks better right now, means it is harder to improve this footage in post. And let's actually add some noise reduction to the R5 footage raw on the top, and you can see what I mean. It obviously doesn't look as good as the correctly exposed footage, but it's three stops under. But that pure noise, although it looks uglier at first when it's untouched, does mean that Resolve's noise reduction has something to work with. Okay, so let's keep with the noise theme and take a look at our high ISO tests. For these, we take this shot of the chart and ramp up the ISO value while compensating with the shutter speed. So the exposure doesn't change. All that's changing is the higher ISO value, so that we can see how the camera handles that and how much noise it's adding, and the higher shutter speed, which should only really affect motion. It's basically a still shot, so this basically means we can directly compare the noise levels at different ISOs with the same exposure values. Now, we all know how good the A7S Mark III is at high ISOs. It's what made the original A7S so popular all those years ago, and the Mark III follows in the same footsteps as the original. It's without a doubt one of the best cameras for high ISO work on the market. So before we even started this test, we were expecting the R5 to be the underdog here. We used log on both cameras, and on the R5 recorded externally using the 4K HQ mode, as that's what we expected to have the best high ISO performance due to its downsampling that it's using. And we wanted to give the R5 that little bit of a helping hand to try and compete as much as possible with the A7S, which we knew would be better. So at ISO 800, both cameras look very clean, as you'd expect. The little bit of noise that is there is finer on the R5 than on the A7S, which is a bit of a recurring theme. The Canon's noise overall is that little bit more organic looking, and it's finer and more detailed, which will make it easier to take out in post-production. At ISO 3200, the R5 is actually still looking very clean indeed. I do notice the noise a little bit more on the A7S here, which actually, which is quite surprising. And it's a similar situation at ISO 6400. I do think the R5 looks slightly better. However, remember that we are in that downsampled 4K HQ mode here, which might well be why. When we jump up to 12,800, the tables turn, and the A7S is definitely starting to look better. Interestingly, the A7S does seem to look cleaner here than it did at ISO 6400, which is that dual native ISO type effect that people have been talking about online. So officially, the camera doesn't have a dual native ISO, but it does seem to behave like it does with a definite drop off in noise when it gets to 10,000 ISO in log. Up at 25,600, the difference is even bigger. The A7S is the clear winner. However, the R5 is actually doing very well. This is a really high ISO value. And although there is definitely luminoise, there's minimal chroma noise. And because it's quite fine and detailed still, noise reduction in post will do a reasonable job with this footage. And at 51,200, we're definitely out of the R5's comfort zone. In fact, most people would consider this pretty unusable. The A7S, of course, is still going strong, as you'd expect if you'd used previous A7S cameras. So let's finish by looking at some of our sharpness tests that we did. We'll focus on the most important modes in each camera, as otherwise this video will just get very long and boring. 
We've already done a video looking at these results on the A7S Mark III, which found that the quality and the sharpness pretty much stays the same, no matter which mode you have it in for stationary shots like this. Slow motion, all eye, H265, they all look pretty similar in terms of sharpness levels. But let's now compare them to Canon's R5. And to start with, this is the 8K RAW mode, which as we saw in the shots of Jonna at the start of this video, is incredibly detailed. If we crop into 300% on the charts in the middle of this shot, you can get a bit of a taste as to just how much detail is in those 8K RAW files. It is a huge difference. 4K HQ recorded internally is nowhere near as detailed as the 8K RAW, but it's still definitely beating the A7S Mark III. I can read the words color checker on that x right chart, while on the A7S you just definitely can't. So that downsampling from the 8K image for this 4K HQ mode is definitely making a big difference to sharpness. Now let's drop to the R5's regular 4K mode, which is the one you can film in even once the camera has hit any overheating limits. Now the tables turn, and the A7S Mark III is more detailed. We also see some aliasing patterns on the Canon footage in the diagonal lines on the chart and some of the books. And this is an important comparison, as if you want to film all day long with these cameras, these are going to be the modes that you're most likely to be using. And the R5 is good here, but the A7S is definitely better. This is also the same once you get up to the high frame rate modes. Both cameras can do 4K 120p internally, but the Sony seems to be more detailed, both in normal 120p mode and in its slow and quick mode, which just makes it all the more impressive that the A7S Mark III doesn't seem to overheat in 4K 120p, while the R5 definitely does. So hopefully you found these tests interesting. I mean, they only scratch the surface, of course. There's so many aspects of these cameras that we just haven't looked at here at all. But there are some interesting takeaways. It shows just how good that 8K RAW is visually on the R5. That mode really is cinema quality in terms of image quality, both overexposure and in sharpness. It is just leagues above any other modes in either of these cameras. But at the end of the day, the modes which you're going to be spending most of your time in are the regular 4K modes, in which the A7S Mark III does seem to consistently outperform the R5. So, what do you think of these tests? Are there any surprises here for you? Let me know in the comment section down below, and if you want to buy either of these cameras for yourself, then of course just head over to provi.co.uk. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.